Welcome everybody, my name is Niklas Hoschenbeet and today I would like to share with you my first game from the World Cup 2019 which took place in Khanti Mansisk in Siberia in Russia. So the World Cup is a tournament that takes place every two years, it's a knockout tournament and the two finalists, so the last two of 128 players qualify for the candidates tournament and the winner of the candidates tournament qualifies to play the world champion. So this is the road to qualify for world championship match and as you can imagine the best of the best participate in this event. I qualified for the World Cup by reaching a good performance, by reaching a good place in the European Championship earlier this year. So in the first round I played against Arkady Neidic, former German number one and a very strong player. Now he's playing for Azerbaijan. And Neidic and I have played three times before, two times I've lost and once the last game in 2017 was a draw. So the format is as follows, two games, mini match and if it's tied after two games then there are tie breaks with rapid chess and if it's still tied goes to blitz chess and then in the end an Armageddon game decides a game where white has more time, five minutes versus four, but white has to win whereas if it's a draw black goes on to the next round. So now let's begin. In the first game I played with the white pieces against Nidic and let's get going. I turn the engine on and let's see what happened. E4 and the first little surprise already on the first move. Usually Nidic plays E5 and the Berlin defense but in this game he chose the French. And maybe real quick for my German viewers I also talked about this game in the next one in Lubis Lernstunde here on YouTube. You can also find it and I'll put the link in the description. However, these game analysis will be in a little bit more detail even than what we talked about in that video. So the French, knight c3, bishop b4 and we are following the Vinava variation here and Neidic had played this before but I did not really expect it because it's quite a sharp line and he had played it a long time ago and back then he played castle. And now he chose c takes d4 which is the main line in the Vinava. And I thought this was a very smart choice by Neidic because he could specifically prepare this line against me because it was pretty clear I would play like this. And actually I had some kind of intuition before the game to check this line because I felt this might be smart for him to play this, to surprise me and to be very prepared in this line. And I looked at this idea, which we'll see in a moment here, this is the main line, now queen c7, and here the absolute main move is knight e2 to protect the pawn on c3 and not allow queen takes c3 check. But I knew this idea here to go queen d3 to protect the pawn in this way. And this was played by Alpha Zero against Stockfish last year. And Alpha Zero, for those of you who don't know, is that supercomputer by, by Google who taught itself chess in a number of hours only and then destroyed, more or less, you could say, the strongest chess engine, Stockfish. And in one match, in one game, Queen D3 was played, which is quite a rare move. And the game between Alpha Zero and Stockfish ended in a draw, but Alpha Zero had quite a lot of pressure. So I thought, well, this is a good surprise idea for this game. And indeed, Nidic did not know about it. So Nidic played Queen takes e5, might be already in inaccuracy. In fact, Stockfish went for d takes c3, which is the alternative. And now the game continued between Alpha Zero and Stockfish with Knight f3, b6. Now the bishops were traded here and this position is a bit better for white but Stockfish managed to hold in the game. If white tries to transpose with knight e2 to what we're seeing in the game then black doesn't have to take still. Black would play knight c6, queen takes c3 and just keep on developing and that would be somewhat a typical Vienna position where white is up a pawn but black has better development and the white king is in the center still, it's not clear where it's going to be safe. 
So I think d takes c3 should be played here. Queen takes e5 is a very natural move, taking this pawn of check, knight e2, d takes c3, and now queen takes c3. This is the whole point why it trades to queens early, which makes sense because often his king is less safe than the black king. And now knight bc6, queen takes c3 is another move, but also in that end game, white should be a bit better. Queen takes e5, knight takes e5, now knight g3. And before the game, when I checked this line briefly, I saw a game by Jordan van Forest where he played exactly like that and I just followed this game because I know van Forest, very strong player and also very, very apt in openings. He knows what he's doing. So I just followed this game here and this seems to be a good plan. f6, bishop, b2. And here to put a knight on h5 where it's attacking the pawn on f6 and therefore forcing black to go passive again with knight d7. Because here if black plays a different move, let's say bishop d7, then white could take immediately on f6 and follow up with f4 and the dark squares are really the problem for black in this position. In general, what can we say about this endgame? Well, white has the two bishops, that's an advantage for white for sure. And also white has a pass pawn here on the h file which can march forward in the future. Also it feels to me that white has a little bit better or easier development. What's going on for black? Black has center pawns and also black has less pawn islands. You can see here, especially on the queen side, the white pawns are a little bit weakened. So all in all, both sides have their advantages and I think it's a lot about time, who's going to come first is black going to have enough time to consolidate or will white be able to get things going quickly? Knight d7 castle still following this fun for risk game against Kartik from Zurich earlier this year and here fun for risk opponent played a6 which seems a bit slow to me. It also makes sense to in some cases take the square away from the white bishop but in the game Van Voorhees also built up a great advantage, even though in the end the game ended in a draw. Nadej played the more natural move b6. And now the question is how to continue, how to get things going. And here, if you want to, you can pause the video and think about the plan. What would you do next? This is more of a positional question, not so much a tactical question. How would you proceed? What is the right plan here? So. Bishops love open positions and the white plan here should be to push the pawns forward and open up the position, especially against the black king, which is not that safe on f7. Now the next question is how to prepare that. And here the correct move is rook g1, which I chose. Looks a little bit strange, but the idea is very simple to play g4 next. And this is what I did, bishop b7, g4. And my moves flow very naturally, h4, f4, g5. Also, once again, supporting my dark square superiority in this position. Here, black knightage went rook h8. In fact, what I only found out afterwards, until this point, we followed a correspondence game. And that means we did a few things right here. Even in the correspondence game, which followed with bishop c6, white won. And that tells you something. That tells you that this position is already very difficult for black. Because in correspondence chess, people have a lot of time for each and every move. They can use the engine and so on. And even if there, black was not able to defend. Well, it tells you that black is in a good amount of trouble. Here you can see how this correspondence game continued. And same plan. White pushes the pawn forward open up the position and it just flows very naturally here for white f5 opening up later on and white one later so knightage played rook h8 and he had an interesting idea here which we'll see in a moment after f4 rook h6 bishop e2 the move rook a h8 to stop me from going g5 because if i go g5 black can take on h5 and give the rook for two pieces so this is not what I want. There is a problem with this plan though, which I spotted. This plan just doesn't work, as you can also see by the engine bar evaluation, which already shows 
a winning advantage for white. So stop the video here and figure out why this plan didn't work. What can white do now? Well, there's a tactic here with knight takes f6. In general, always check moves that capture something and here knight takes f6 just works. Knight takes f6 is pretty obvious. g5 with the fork wins back the material right away and this happened in the game. And the question is, what happens after rook takes f6? Now bishop takes f6 would be wrong, why it just gives two pieces for the rook. But g5 is good since there's another rook hanging here on the long diagonal and if black, black moves this rook then I just capture the other one and why does a healthy exchange up. Also rook takes h2 doesn't help because after g takes f6 this knight is hanging as well and after knight takes f6 it's just a healthy exchange and white should go on to convert this. So knight h played knight takes f6 g5 rook takes h2 g takes f6 notice that also here i'm attacking the knight on e7 and if rook takes e2 i wouldn't take on e7 right away but first give a check this is important the king goes back and rook takes e7 rook h h2 threatening to create some counterplay but simply rook c7 with the idea of rook bishop e5 check bishop d6 f7 and black is completely busted so knight h played knight f5, I go bishop d3, threatening bishop takes f5 followed by rook g7, so rook h8, h7 is pretty much forced. And here it took quite a long thing and I had a lot of time on the clock and you want to use that time because I was sure my position is very good but still you have to convert, convert a winning position to a win which as they say is quite difficult. And I chose bishop takes f5. White also has other options like bishop e5, but bishop takes f5 looked like a good idea because now there's always the idea to play rook g7 check and get a pawn on the 7th rank supported by my bishop. However, I did not play this right away. I could have, but I felt like this doesn't, doesn't run away. This also would be possible here. However, black has some defensive ideas with bishop c6, bishop a4. And just to make a point here, let's say I play c4, which looks very strong with the idea d takes c4, rook d8, and this is just winning on the spot. Then suddenly black can go d4. And now if bishop takes d4, black plays bishop e4 suddenly and his bishop becomes quite strong. Or even a move like rook h1 might be possible to trade rooks. And if the rook takes on d4, then black can also go bishop a4. And rook d8 would be now, excuse me, rook d8 would be a big mistake because rook h1 check, king d2, rook d1 check picks up the rook. So in a lot of these variations, the move d4 was just annoying to me and black is improving his bishop. And in general, in positions with opposite colored bishops like here, it's really about who has the better placed bishop. And this is why I played the move bishop d4, which I'm quite happy about and proud about afterwards, because I think it's a very important move, not allowing these ideas with bishop e4. Here, Nidish surprised me with the move bishop a6, which I did not see coming. Quite a creative idea, but in the end, it doesn't help black. It doesn't save the position, but the position cannot be saved anyway. Bishop c8 was what I expected, and now white could play rook d1. To threaten rook e7, bishop e6 to stop that, rook g7 check, takes, takes. Now there's the threat of rook takes e6, so black needs to go rook h6. And now rook e3 is a smart move to come and get into the black position, and white should win in the long run. This pawn is just too much of a trump for white. So let's follow the game, bishop a6. Now I played rook g7 check, takes, takes and bishop e2 this makes sense because here what black wants to achieve is not allow the white rook into the black position just like we saw in the variation a moment ago now rook g1 threatening obviously to promote king g8 would allow 
the intrusion with rook g6. This is what black doesn't want. So Nidish's idea was to go bishop g4 and to stop the rook from entering the black camp. For example, rook g3 now could be answered by rook h3. And you don't want to trade rooks here. Maybe white still has some chances, but obstacle pure opposite color bishop endgames are very drawish. So you want to keep heavy pieces on the board. I played rook e1 back, bishop e2. If rook e2, once again I wouldn't trade rooks, but I would go rook h1. Now black cannot stop it. Rook e8, rook h8 stops white from queening or winning material right away, but rook h6, rook c6 getting into the black camp. So bishop e2 back, I repeated moves here once, which made, makes sense because I'm sure my position is winning or very good and I want to get closer to a time control just if I need extra time on the clock. So this is a typical technique you can use in your own games as well. If you are better and you are maybe low on time or you want to get closer to a time control for any reason, or maybe just show that you are in control here, you can just repeat moves once. And now I have to do something else, a4. And the plan is to open up more files for my rook to invade the black into the black position. King g8, king b2. And now Nidic played a5, because otherwise I will play a5 myself. So if black just waits, let's say with a6, then I go a5. B5 allows my king to enter via this route, via the dark squares. And if black takes this pawn, then the B file open up. I just put my king on the A file, king A3, king F7, and now rook G1. And black cannot stop the rook anymore from invading. So for example, bishop G4. And now we use this new newly opened B file, rook B1, and the rook is coming in and there's nothing stopping white from queening soon. And if king g8, then the rook comes via g6. Bishop b5, let's say, rook d6. Black is still keeping everything together, but now the pawns are dropping one after the other and it's just over because white has too many passed pawns. So Nidish played a5 himself. And how should I proceed now? What would you do with white to make progress? So now that a5 has played this pawn is weak and I want to put my rook on the b file, so I went king a1. Getting the king out of the way. White to a1, why not to let's say a3? Because then black could give a check and if I play c3 then black brings the rook back and now there might be some disaster going on. Bishop c4 threatening checkmate. I would need to trade rooks and it would be a draw. So I want to avoid any of this and therefore I put my king on a1. Now black, by the way, I did not mention this. Black is completely paralyzed with the rook and the bishop. He cannot move either one. Obviously if he moves the bishop then my rook is coming in immediately. Also if the bishop goes to h5, well, stopping rook e8, but still my rook is coming in. And this is what black always wants to stop. And if the rook moves, to keep the bishop protected, rook g2 would be the only move, but once again, this allows my rook to intrude. So black waits, king f7, but now rook b1, rook h6, and now rook g1, king g8. If bishop g4, then I could go rook e1, threatening rook e7 or rook e8, so rook g6, stopping that, and now, for example, rook h1. And now I will manage, I will get into a black position, and then these pawns will drop sooner or later, or more material will fall for black. So Nidic played king g8, and now I played rook g3, and Nidic resigned, because the rook is coming in, either by e3 or c3, and there's nothing stopping that. Actually, black can still avoid immediate material losses. And I think Nidic missed that and I missed it as well um, by playing bishop h5. And now rook e6 to stop the check from the a rank or to be able to put the bishop in between. But the position is still lost because 
black is completely paralyzed just has to be passive i can improve the position of my king bring the king to d4 take on d5 this will end also in a win for white and it's not that much difficult anymore so after rook g3 Nidic resigned and i scored the first win in this mini match and about this game i'm very happy because i think from beginning to finish it was an excellent excellent game if i can pat myself on the shoulder a little bit like that the preparation worked out perfectly with this alpha zero idea queen d3 and then we got into this position with the opposite color bishops and i was very happy finding this move bishop d4 and also this interesting idea with a4 a5 sidestepping with the king to the a file to a1 also some aesthetics and in the end a clean finish so that meant i was leading the match with 1-0 but there was another game and in that game i would play the black pieces and of course nidish would come at me with everything he got because he had to win to not be eliminated from the tournament in this game we're going to see in the next video until then i hope you enjoyed this one write me in the comments what you saw did you answer the questions and if you're not subscribed yet make sure to do that so you will be notified when i publish the next videos. Until then.